Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Taylor Jones and I have one question to ask you. Do you have any, and I mean any, idea what time it is? If not, let me welcome you to Season 5 of Cold Man's Winter. Standing in line, marking time, waiting for the welfare dime. Cause they can't buy a job The man in the silk suit hurries by as, it, as he catches the poor old lady's eye And just for fun he says Get a job That's just the way it is Some things will never change That's just the way it is Oh don't you believe that? I know what you're thinking. It's been a long time, Taylor. Where have you been? Well, when it comes to working a lot and not having enough time in your hands, you always have to be focused on your freedom one way or another. I think it's about time to set, set myself back to the basics. In other words, Welcome back to my YouTube channel, T.C. Jones Edits, for another episode of Cold Man's Winter. Long-awaited episode number four, but what do I want to talk about for this, this episode? <clears throat> well, now, when it comes to dealing with hardships, all I can think about for this episode is how... One person has been dealing with hardships and struggles and pains and being humiliated on a daily basis to being back on the basis, to back to being a fighter. I mean, we've been dealing with a lot of changes and ever since that first part of Bruce Hornsby's That's Just The Way It Is that I sung, I mean, what... What can I talk about for this episode of Cold Man's Winter after a somewhat hiatus? Well, I want to talk about um, uh, being accepted. Yeah. When, you, when you're dealing with acceptance and being accepted for who you are, do you really take the time and say, hey, this is exactly what I wanted to see myself do. This is where I want to, want to build up. I mean, I, where do I go from here? Well, honestly, when it came to a woman named Bethany Carver, well, her life wasn't always as positive as it seems. But who is Bethany Carver? Well, let me tell you like this. It all takes place in 1968. Uh, tender age of five years old. Going to school. And let's say that she was from Let's say she was from Mackenzie, Tennessee. Mackenzie, where the Bethel University Wildcats are from. Shout out to Mackenzie, by the way. Because for those that, that didn't know, last season I gave a shout out to the Mackenzie Lady Rebels who won the TSSAA basketball championship for, for the girls' side of the high school basketball team. Just, just know that. I ain't forgot about y'all. So, Mackenzie, this one's for you. But, Bethany Carver, five years old, lived a life with her mother and father, Jolene and Paul. They have been married since 1963. And this was like fresh after, like fresh out of high school and straight to college. Like a teenage love affair. But in 
1963, when Jolene told Paul that she was pregnant, they took the time and take their parenting seriously. Because when at the hospital, the doctor told them that it's a girl. Bethany, she was, she was the prettiest, prettiest thing to Jolene and Paul. And they made it clear to stay, stay spiritually grounded with the Lord and teach, teach uh, Bethany how to live life, do good and bad. Fall 1968, it was a shocking year, a tough year because of the the infamous assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. followed by Bobby Kennedy to the fact that some schools are starting to end segregation with having black blacks and whites come together as one integrated, but some of the individuals in town they were against it they opposed they had bigotry in their hearts and it's like even with or without the confederate battle flag the pickup trucks and all that but one day at work paul got the got the news that jolene was actually making her way back from a trip from Martin to McKenzie when an 18-wheeler actually lost control of um, lost control of driving like road conditionings and whatnot that a gigantic explosion caused caused the whole whole street to get cleared up like blocked off and everybody who was driving on the intersections like whoa they spotted the explosion so big that even Rob was like oh man this is bad and for for Bethany when when Paul told his daughter Bethany about the tragic car accident that Jolene got herself caught up in. Bethany, Bethany was crying her eyes out. The father was was so heartbroken over this. And remember, this is like elementary, the elementary days of Bethany. Carver. So around eight eight days after the tragic incident, Paul he actually did a eulogy for for his wife and he held and he held Bethany's hand. stand in front of Jolene's casket a wooden brown casket closed casket flowers on 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 top Paul he actually did what he did he told the truth. He had kept kept Bethany by his side, and even his co-workers were comforting him. Matter of fact, his co-workers did did the Paul bearing. So they took a little 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 trip to the grave the graveyard. And someone had had the had the nerve to play um, Elvis Presley 
Someone had the nerve to play Elvis Presley, but they did it for one good reason. To comfort Paul, because the person that played Elvis Presley at the funeral, they did they wanted Paul, Paul and Bethany to know that Jolene will is walking as in Oh, I'm gonna walk walk the Milky Way way. Oh Lord, one of these days, one of these days, yes, I'm gonna walk walk the Milky Way way. One of these days, well, 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 I'm gonna you. You know, the usual. I'm gonna. This earth to take a stand. With God, I will join the Christian white band. Angel, angel white band. When I'm gonna walk, walk the Milky Way way. Oh Lord, one of these days, one of these days. And after the funeral went went completely well, Bethany and Paul. They went, they went home. And some of the relatives that came to the funeral, they actually had a good time. They ate and, and of course, an uncle, Bethany's uncle, Uncle Larry, he started playing a song. But let's say that Now, let's say that he was the one responsible for a little tune. He played a little tune that that made Bethany change her mood, change her mindset. And even when she had to be humiliated, which it wasn't wasn't the time yet but a little hint he wrote a song he made a song called I am not I am not ashamed to fight back even though it was just an instrumental I am not ashamed to fight back yeah, he said in a spoke, spoken word. I have been bullied so many times. I have been placed with my back against the wall. And I hear negative things ru running through my mind. I have seen my friends turn into enemies. But with God, a Christian, I should not pretend to be. In a world where a lot of folks can shut everyone up, God gave me one mouth and I have to use it strong enough until the day when I decide to say, I've used it up, I had enough. I'm not ashamed to fight back. Oh no, I'm not ashamed. I lost my parents. I lost my true love. From human, I mean, from the human flesh to transformation as a dove. We only live once, and we have to live it right. I'd rather see the golden sun with the blue skies, as well as a black starry, starry night, and a, with, and a golden moonlight, a silver moonlight. I'm sick and tired of um, 
I'm sick and tired of separating the colors white from black. We have to be in the gray area just like that. I am not ashamed to fight back. Oh no, I'm not ashamed. And when, un when Uncle Larry explained to Bethany why, why he made that song, he came up with it on the top of his head and in a spoken word like poetry. It's, it's because, because one of these days you will learn a thing or two about how, how you've been through a lot of hardships. People will talk smack about you people will um will try to rub your feathers in the in the worst way with honey with glue with tar but with the lord you have to break free because i can't do this all all the time because i'll be i'll be gone soon but you you have to carry on <clears throat> So they hugged. It, it was peace. But that was just a tough beginning. Now, when it came to dealing with losing a mom and having a single single parent, a widower turn father figure to keep to keep um, darn uh oh <laughs> good thing I caught that to keep up with timing like to keep from getting out out of keep from getting into harmful decisions harmful situations and depression Paul and Bethany father and daughter made it clear to be a family to keep Jolene's legacy alive so in elementary school <clears throat> Bethany was a smart student she respected all the teachers she got along with all of her classmates, but 1973, all hell started to break loose when she went to middle school. How, how did this happen? What went wrong? What went wrong? Well, let's just say that there were some, uh, some girls in Bethany's grade fifth grade but they actually came from uh let's say that they actually moved from the new jersey yeah new jersey is where they're from and they they were like they were like the the coolest they wanted to be so cool but they were actually jerks and when and when fifth grade started the the jerks from New Jersey it was like a group of four four girls one was one was the leader she was a blonde by the name of, well, what, what could I name her? Mona. Minus the Lisa, as in Big Bad Mona. At 10 years old, you always have to start, start a fight with anyone as if she rules the school. So when they first, when Mona and her crew spotted Bethany eating lunch, 
after praying, she started eating. But unfortunately, Mona, she started to, to stand from the stand with her with her hand on the desk on the lunch table. So, well, hello, can I help you? Who are you? Um, I'm Bethany Carver. I don't know. And who are you? My name is Mona. Big Bad Mona from New Jersey. And these are my friends. Michelle, Shirley, and the silent one. Her name is um, Rachel. And I heard you the smartest, smartest person in the school. Yeah? Well, tell me this. Why, what made you think, think about doing God's, I mean, what do you, what do you think about God? It's like she, like Bethany was getting tested. Not trying to be a jerk or whatnot. She she's told the truth. God is a powerful, powerful mastermind, the creator of all things, humans, objects like animals, the trees, and everything that is made. Okay. What's what's the number one rule? Do unto others as much as other others do unto you so she she was very Bethany I remember Bethany was very faithful with God and it was all thanks to her father Paul and oh if that's well if that's true then what if I did this picked up the milk carton pour it on her head and the other girl, Shirley, pulled the chair back. Rachel, she said, I mean, well, she didn't say nothing. She pushed her. And Michelle, she looked and she turned around and said, do this to anybody that's planning to help Bethany, because, like I said, Big Bad Mona, they were jerk, and her friends, they were jerks. They, they picked on Bethany, ruined her lunch. Now you listen to me, Miss Bethany. We run the lunch now. You make sure you, you stay the heck out our way. We may be new here, but we going to rule the school. Got it? As good as done. She didn't want to say anything negative. But everybody looked at her, at Bethany like, Oh, man. But while, while Big Bad Mona and the girls left, Rachel looked at her and said, no hard feelings. This is just business. She just whispered. Because honestly, Rachel didn't want to want to do this. But she can't even stand up to Mona alone. It's kind of like being a sellout. If she, if she told and stood up. But she had to keep it on the hush. Everybody wants to do anything for clout, as people would say nowadays. But people would do anything to get respect. But when, but when Paul found out about this. Bethany, what the heck happened to you? New girl named Mona, Big Bad Mona, came to me and said that from now on, she and her friends will rule the school. Especially lunchtime. Where have I heard that name before? Because honestly, it didn't make sense. 
how Mona from New Jersey and her friends would, would treat her like garbage in McKenzie, Tennessee, in middle school this time. But the drama didn't stop there. It was like an everyday basis. Bethany couldn't even sit at her lunch table. She had to sit somewhere else because Big Bad Mona took her lunch table. And they, ev they even planned to put everybody else out their misery. To the fact that even the principals were so scared to do something about this. The teachers. But... She had been dealing with this, Bethany has been dealing with this, this uh, bully shtick as if she wasn't accepted. She was looked at up like an outcast. She would do anything to be accepted, but the only person who, who accepts Bethany for who she is, is the Lord for watching her and guiding her as well as her father, Paul. Now. was shocking. After dealing with this madness, this bully madness for four long years in middle school, well, let's just say that in eighth grade, before, before Bethany moved on to high school, spring 1977, after the Christmas break was over, like the other half of the 8th grade school year, junior high, middle school, McKenzie, an African-American kid by the name of Moses, Moses Monroe, he decided to put his foot down. An African-American kid who moved to McKenzie from Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio. He had enough. Because one one day, Bethany was trying to find a spot that was not considered owned by Big Bad Mona and the crew. So she found a spot. Uh, ahem, Miss Bethany what the heck do you think you're doing? I thought it was where the heck you're going. Well, look, look, I, I know what I'm saying. Finding a spot that's not considered yours. Besides, enough is enough. I'm not trying to start no beef with you or, or fight. Matter of fact, if you... If you're going to ask me another question about God, then I might as well give you an answer. How come God despises people like you? Because, I can tell you, you're self-centered. You don't know the true meaning of letting, letting go or turning the other cheek. Matter of fact, if you got some, something to say about this, why don't you go ahead and hit me? Punch me. Let's see if the principals got anything to say. If unless they're scared. So Bethany decided, you know what? Go ahead. Humiliate me. Kick my butt. I don't care. Yo, wait now wait a minute. Before you do that, why don't you kick mine? If if she suffers, I suffer with her. Name is Moses. Moses Monroe, straight out of Cleveland, Ohio. And I'll be darn to let Miss Bethany Carver get her feelings hurt over you. You want to talk about this? You, we, can send, we can handle this with my father. But what they did know is that the father, he transferred from the from Cleveland Police Department to McKenzie. 
So he moved to Tennessee. He moved his fam family to Tennessee. But just like... But just like... Um, Bethany's father, Paul... Moses' father lost his wife. But instead... In a robbery gone, a robbery turned murder, to the fact that he was so mad, he found the murderers responsible, and took. Well, I wouldn't consider revenge, but he took the job seriously. That he actually set a trap, and his own sons, and Moses was one of them, because he had a, because Moses had an older brother. By the name of Marcus, Marcus Monroe. They had, they set a booby trap. And they had to put the money inside. And the thug that actually robbed and killed their, killed their mother. He found the money. And say... Oh, it, oh yeah, it's gonna be good. Whoa. The net flies, appears out of nowhere. Oh, what the heck? I'll take that back. Well, I'll be darned. It's the son of a jerk that killed my wife. And robbed her as well. I mean, he was he was a hero cop for that. Monroe's father was a hero cop from Cleveland. He put the thug that killed his wife behind bars with the help of his sons by setting up a trap. And because, because Monroe brought up his father, Rachel's like, wait a minute. You, you're not talking. Wait a minute. You're not saying that the... That your father is from the Cleveland Police Department? Shut up, Rachel. No. No. I know this. I know him. He actually helped my father. What? Shirley and Michelle like, for real? For real, Rachel? Shoot. If that's the case, so be it. So, Monroe humiliated Big Bad Mona. Like, you know what? Screw you. Y'all ain't worth nothing. It ain't over. But for Monroe, it was for now. <laughs> and he was so glad that he got that out the out of system. Hey, listen. You don't have to deal with this shenanigan anymore. I mean, you really, you really had the had the nerve to stand up like a proud white girl. I'm no no race no racism. Oh none 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 taken. Man, it's really cool. You really stood out for me. Well, my father said, at some point in your life, you can't keep letting fear get the best of you. Especially when you have to deal with acceptance. <gasps> your father, I mean, wait, your father said the same to you? Well, it's been like that ever since I lost my mom. Oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember I, I was watching it on the news. And I actually bumped into your Uncle Larry. How? Well, let's just say that I had a mind, mind of music. And he, and he, oh, he actually told me about the song he wrote, I mean, the song he made up in his head. And I actually came up with a little, little sound, voice, verse on my own, spoken word. Well, I would love to hear it. To live by the gun or die by the gun. To be surrounded by drugs, being abusive, trying to live, live life as a high, high shot, 
I'm a high caller, a shot caller, a player, a baller. But what's the excuse? A lot of thugs, they end up dead or locked up, knowing that they'll never see their friends and family again. Like an old song, nobody wants you when you're down and out. But there's no need for me to scream and shout. Instead, I'll just, I'll just learn this from here on out. As a matter of fact, I'm not ashamed to fight back. So after, after Monroe, after Moses, the little, little snippet of what uh, Bethany's Uncle Larry was doing, the I'm not ashamed to fight back thing. Bethany started getting teary eyed and hugged and hugged Moses. Oh, Moses, that is so beautiful. And this is like the part when Uncle Larry said, she started to realize that Uncle that her Uncle Larry once said, I'm sick of separating white from black when it's supposed to be a gray, gray thing. Because if y'all remember, white plus gray equals black, white plus black equals gray. But that part came came to mind. This is exactly what Uncle Larry was talking about. Tired of separating white from black when it's all a great thing. And it worked just like a charm. So, not only that, Mr. Mr. Monroe Lieutenant Monroe stopped by to see Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul Carver. Moses' father had a talk with, with Paul. Talking about what went down in, on that, at school on that day. A black man talking to a white man. They're both widowers. One died from a tragic car accident, which was explosive. The other was was gunned down after being robbed. And they were very pleased to the fact that Monroe, no, Moses and Bethany were getting along after dealing with Big Bad Mona. To the one, to the fact that the silent one, Rachel, had enough. I mean, he was surprised. Everybody knew about mm, Moses' father, the hero cop from Cleveland. And they actually became the best of friends. But in 19... So, this was back in 1977. But when 1977, the fall hit, late August, whether early, mid, or late August, Bethany Carver, Moses Monroe, welcome to McKinsey High, high school. Uh, Mrs., I mean, well, Miss Big Bad Mona and her crew, the New Jersey Rebel, Rebelettes. They actually were starting to cause complete turmoil from freshman to senior year. But because of how powerful their actions were, they even made the boys feel feel shook and soft. If Bethany's on her own, Bethany is weak, she has to accept it. But she tried her very best to stay powerful and brave. But I guess, I guess Mona don't, don't understand why she don't take, 
why Bethany doesn't take her her threat seriously. Even when Rachel said no hard feelings. Well, it's not considered business anymore. But Bethany, she didn't say it yet. She didn't say it like that yet. She actually just, just moved on. Because one day, she actually got jumped. Heck. She even got robbed too. Money wise. From Big Bad Mona. Shirley. Holding her down. Michelle watching her every movement. As well as Rachel. What? What? You want some of this too? Big Bad Mona. She got tough. But sometimes you say. Dang Mona. But where was Moses? He spotted the whole thing. But, unfortunately, he had, he had to face Mona as well. So after being robbed and jumped by Mona and the girls, the same, the same excuse Rachel said, well, she got sick and tired because my, my mom, she got sick and tired of the shtick. She got sick and tired of dealing with being a jerk and keeping her, keeping her tongue. So once again, she said, it's still, it's still business. It's still business. But at the same time, I said, at the same time, I'm proud of you. It's still business, but I'm, but I'm proud of you. Keep it up. So anyway, Mon R Moses picked up Bethany, sent her to the school nurse, and they found. And he told exactly what happened. Oh. Oh, them no, New Jersey girls are up to no good. Listen, if you have to deal with them ever again, you got to let, let me know. Oh. Oh, he was like, oh, the, the doctor, the school nurse. Well, she was, she was down. She was down with the gangster, gangster mood. She was about to, about to get it on and popping. As if she got a baseball bat. Like, but instead, she was kind of, kind of like a mom. Mama don't take no shorts. <laughs> so, but let's say that the school nurse was black. Rocking the afro like, oh, oh no, she did not just put your hand, her hands on you. And to, so she actually got her back. Thanks to Moses for, for keeping up with, keeping up with, um, Bethany, do good and bad. She had to keep it going. So after after Paul and Mr. Monroe heard the news, they found out quick that this so-called bully, the New Jersey rebelettes are getting completely out of hand. And if they keep this up, they're going to end up dead or locked up. Wishing that they never did something stupid. But it's obvious that they learned, learned the gangster shtick from their own, own parents, their own family members who were in the mafia in New Jersey. And it ain't even Italian. They're not even Italian. They're not even 
Cuban. It's just, they just have this mentality ever since the uh, West Side Story. The Sharks versus the Jets. Boom, boom, boom. Woo! Boom, boom. What is this? Romeo and Juliet again? Some people still don't understand how far this shtick can go. But Paul will still still praise me. Well, Paul was still praising Mo Moses' bravery to keep his daughter daughter in check by taking her to the school nurse after getting jumped. And not to mention, Rachel, she returned the money. She returned the money. And they actually became friends, by the way. Because after after dealing with this pain and seeing seeing the power between a black kid, a black kid from Cleveland and a little and a white girl from Mackenzie. Close together, trying to help each other in a time of need. But mostly mostly Moses was trying to help her. But dig this. Rachel felt like, you know what? This is one thing that I'm missing in life. And to be a rebel at from New Jersey, I have to I have to put my foot down. So kind of like Destiny's Child, one one monk, one female member leaves. Or what no, not Destiny's Child. More like escape. It's like, like Latasha going solo, leading the candy to Mika and Tiny, in frustration. But in the seventies, who was Escape? To me, Big Bad Mona was Latasha, the leader. Rachel, she was the. She was like Tamika, Tamika Scott, who, who found her passion outside of the group. I mean, oh, and shout out to Tamika Scott, who, who recently did her own thing. She got her, she got a cookbook, she got cooking sauce, and, she, and her song tonight with Method Man actually is is really good if i if i was in the riaa i would give her and method man an escape and wu-tang collaboration platinum certified platinum or better double platinum but rachel was kind of like tamika scott in the group she was finally free to express the damages that were done and she got along with Carver, Bethany Carver and Moses. They they became friends. Bethany was all alone. Then it was Moses. Now it's Rachel. She left the New Jersey Rebelettes. Which is shocking because in McKenzie, the team name was the Rebels. Ain't that ironic? Isn't it ironic? But... But all that being said, they actually actually got along just well. And because Rachel decided to bring out her true colors, she actually wanted to learn more about God from Bethany. And they 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 got along just fine. But Freshman year started off rocky. Sophomore year it got rocky. But the so-called New Jersey Rebelettes, they're now Michelle, Shirley, and Big Bad Mona. Rachel turned to the good side. 
Of course, Big Bad Mona would consider Rachel selling out, but she don't give a dang less. Because she's free. And she even convinced, Rachel convinced that Moses and Bethany would need to go out on a date. Heck, she even told Sergeant Monroe, I mean, Police Officer Monroe, as well as Mr. Paul, that they got, they got to give it a shot. Bethany and Mon, Mon, Moses dating? Heck, even everybody from McKenzie High were, well, they were... They were shocked to hear the news. And they did. A, a black, black and white relationship. An interracial relationship that started in 1979. 1978-79 school year. Ma, Bethany Carver and Moses Monroe. They started dating. And they went to the movies. It was like Greece. Greece is the word. But this is 79. The year when disco was coming to an end. Everybody was so pleased how, how Ma Moses stood out for Bethany since the 8th grade. And how he did, did the darndest thing. But sophomore year, it went smoothly. So, of course, they had to bump into Mo's, I mean, Big Bad Mona, Shirley, and Michelle. Then they did it again in 79-80, junior year. They both, they both took a driving test on the same day, which is shocking. They were dating. They were shocked. I mean, they were dating since 79, 78-79. They they passed, they took a driving test, driver's ed, and they both got their license. But, what were the cars? Now, with the help of, of the police officer and his older brother, Marcus, Mr. Mon, Mo, Mr. Moses Monroe ended up with a 1977 Dodge Monaco, the Blues Brothers Mobile, and the color was blue. Meanwhile, Paul, her father, Bethany's father, with the help of Uncle Larry, who was still playing piano, but unfortunately his health started to decline. Well, they helped him out helped her pick a car and the car that she chose was a 1979 let me see oh I'm on my laptop I'm, I'm looking up like what kind of car would would I see Miss Bethany drive hmm No, that ain't, that ain't good. I don't want that. No. No, I don't want that. Let me see. Let, let me see. Let me see. Oh. Mmm. No, no, I chose the right one. Okay. Miss Bethany Carver decided to buy, I mean, decided to get a. 1980, an all new 1980 Cadillac, the coupe, Cadillac DeVille. It was a four door Cadillac DeVille. The color was, let's say, the color was brown. Bethany drove a brown. 
four-door Cadillac DeVille, or, or as black people would call it, Box Caddy. And it was thanks to the help of the family members. But of course, they did get a job. Monk Moses and Bethany, they they got a job. They they made sure to save money. But for the so-called mm, called rebelettes from New Jersey, or from a quartet to a trio, they actually found a way to play with their emotions. But Rachel was not going to let that slide. Spreading rumors on spreading rumors like and the fact that on prom night Rachel Bethany and Moses dressed in red, white, and blue like the American flag they came to prom together like like the three amigos, but three went two women, one man, junior year, and the New Jersey rebelettes had a had a bucket of paint set up, and they had it located where they were hanging out at and one one false move like if they don't know they're gonna end up getting getting sp sprayed but but wait a minute Rachel found out about this <gasps> wait a minute it's a trap um um let's let's just go over there what's going on Rachel <sighs> the stupid rebelettes of New Jersey's trying to Trying to stop our shine. And you already know. Wait, I thought you were tired of him. I am. That's why I stopped, stopped dealing with him. But they didn't know. Know that Rachel would expose. Both her own. Bullies. So they decided. So the rebelettes decided to just. Sit down, and they ended up being the three stooges. Paint fell on them. What Oh, man. Dang it. Is that Rachel? Wait. That's the sellout? Yeah, it's the sellout. Oh, man. This inter... He's still hanging out with... With the... With the white... White girl and... That godly girl and that black guy. So they lost the battle in the junior prom. They worked. Junior year went smoothly. But. Another another bullet blew. Another bullet was shot out the gun. A gun called reality. Referring to the fact that. Um. Dang it, man, dude. Anyway, um. Uh, what was I about to say? Oh, yes. Um, in before Christmas, like, back in October. October to 1979. Well, no, no, no. 1980. December 1980. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm back. Look, Taylor, just choose one. Choose the one month. Okay. October 1980. And of course, a couple months after taking the senior drape pictures. It was a shame that Uncle Larry. His health was still declining. And he succumbed to cancer liver cancer and he was like let's say he was around 59 he wasn't supposed to turn 60 until May May of 1981 
And Miss, Miss Bethany, little Miss Bethany, was hurt. Hurt after losing her own uncle. But, but she did remember what he said back in 1968. We all, we all have to go. And I can't, I can't help you. You're going to have to figure some things out on your own and fight on your own. Especially when, when you're a dove. You're tarred and f tarred with honey, glue. You have to find a way to break, break free. And that's with the Lord. And they, and they did. And she did. But as for Paul, well, he started started getting getting ill. Health issues started to to play a big part in him too in nineteen eighty. They started coughing coughing dramatically. It's powerful. But He's still trying to hold on and stay close to his daughter, Bethany's side. And senior year. Senior year in high school. Christmas time is here. December. School's out for two weeks. Now, from August to December... Bethany, Moses, and Rachel, they fought me. They actually got into a real life fight with with uh, Mona, Shirley, and Michelle. But Moses would never, never fight a woman. Because a man fighting a woman without an exclusive reason, that's just stupid. So he decided to find a way to fight a woman and let's just say that his idea was like a way to keep him from from using his hands but it was it was Mona's fault first he spotted her pushed or tripped she pushed or tripped uh He pushed or tripped uh, Rachel, but when but when Moses tried to help her up, like Bethany was like, "No, don't, don't. This is way too familiar, and it's getting out of hand." What? So what you're saying is we can't be ashamed to fight back. Uncle, your Uncle Larry. Uh, well, what's wrong? You can't even help your friend out? You know good and doggone well why we're not going to fall for your baloney ever again. Yes, Bethany stood out proud, saying, enough is enough, Mona. You've been peeing us off for eight years. And she said it with the passion that she's mad. Her arms are folded. And even Ma, even Ma Moses decided like, you know what? I, I had to deal with this crap for how long? Five years in school. So it's kind of like Rachel didn't say anything because Michelle, she was about to about to stomp her out while Shirley was about to kick her. And as for Mona, big bad Mona, she did the unbelievable thing. She pulled out a Smith and Wesson. Revolver. A Smith and Wesson revolver. Cock the hammer. Which one of y'all want to die first? 
Oh, wait. I already know who. The sellout first. Sellout. <gasps> Let me like. <gasps> no! Don't do it! And let's just say that the school nurse from from freshman year that helped that said, oh, uh oh, it's going down. Let's just say that she spotted what went down. I mean, uh, <gasps> but this time, <laughs> the African American school nurse that had a baseball bat, her afro turned into curling to curls because we're in the 80s y'all she actually snuck up from behind Mona as Mona was about to pull the trigger on Rachel but I guess Shirley Shirley was about to oh crap oh crap the school nurse she was running because the school nurse wasn't nut, nothing to be messed with. The school nurse ain't to be messed with. Not with a baseball bat. And Michelle, she ran too. Oh gosh. Hey, hey, where the heck you heck you rebelettes going? Surprise Mona. Hear me. Surprise Mona. Mona. Mona turned around. Boom. Mm. Ah! Hit in both of her knees with a baseball bat, and the she swung the swung the gun out of her hand. But she screamed, "Don't touch it! Nobody's don't touch! You don't want your fingerprints." Oh! <laughs> so instead, Moses and Bethany grab grabs Rachel. Rachel up. She was standing still. She didn't want to make a move, but knowing that she was going to get jumped regardless and killed. Now that's when Miss, that's when Miss, uh, Miss School Nurse took care of business. She was taking care of business. People were saved. Rachel was saved. Taking care of business. But Mona, Big Bad Mona, she wasn't that tough. Not without her pistol. No, nah, no. Her gun was knocked out of her hand after getting swatted, swatted in the knees with a baseball bat. Her knees will be bruised. Luckily, her knees, bones weren't broken. She just got bruised. She had it coming for going too far with this bullying shtick. Try to be the reign supreme, bringing her New Jersey family, family mafia blood in her. Trying to spread, like spreading a disease in Tennessee. From New Jersey to Mackenzie, Tennessee, then everybody was tired of it. But later on. They were Shirley and Michelle were, were were ranted, were were yelled at, and of course, Big Bad Mona cursed her head off to a storm. About to throw biggest tantrum, as in, why did you run away? Where's the loyalty anymore between you ladies? I trusted you. And you can scare over a stupid Negro nurse. <gasps> Why else did I pack a gun? Oh man. Then they knew they knew they F I mean they messed up. They knew they messed up. But Mona messed up calling calling uh the school School nurse, the N word. But, but the madness was far from over. They actually moved on. 
from that and learn their lesson. Meanwhile, Rachel, Rachel brought Montgomery, Moses, Moses and, dang it, Moses and, uh, Bethany a gift for Christmas. Christmas time in 1980. Now, Montgomery, Moses, he, he got himself a, he got himself a, a flannel button down shirt. And as for, for Bethany, she ended up with a, a pullover that says that has her high school on in the front, but on the back of her pullover, it's really, really want to make Bethany tear up in memory of Larry, Larry Carver. In memory of Larry Carver. It was it was so so thoughtful for 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 Rachel to give give Bethany a pullover for her school that she attended with a rest in peace shout out because if you remember I said Un Uncle Larry he died from cancer in October of 1980. Meanwhile, Bethany gave Moses as well as Oh, oh yeah. Can you go and uh, go in the car? Oh, you can make the video. Oh, I can pause it. Wow. So in so Rachel gave Christmas Christmas gifts to Moses and Bethany. Bethany gave to the entire Monroe I mean, the Monroe family. Marcus Officer Monroe as well as Moses. <laughs> matching a matching suit. As if they were going to be a singing trio from the old days. You know, back when bands used to dress up with conch hairstyles and play guitars and whatnot. That was very smooth. But as for Rachel, Bethany gave her a... Well, let's say that she had had a prop of a platinum record with with one of Rachel's school pictures on there as a way of saying from a bully to a friend it was God God bless you for what you have done for the, for the so-called situations that went down. You actually helped me overcome my fears and accept being strong and faithful for who I am. But as for Mon Moses, what did Mo Moses give Bethany and Rachel? Rachel, she ended up with a iconic new, I mean, an iconic jersey. Well, she's not, not a sports fan, but she had a, had a iconic Bill Walton NBA jersey from the Portland Trail Blazers. And it was red. 
a red NBA jersey with the white and black stripe. And not to mention, for, for Bethany, well, for Bethany, she got, she got a gift that was meant for her lifetime. I mean, this gift actually is what, is what she enjoyed, she loved. And she's been rocking the rocket for a long time. Referring to a black leather jacket. But because, because Bethany and Moses were dating, he gave her more than that. He gave her a beret hat, black beret hat. Because in junior year, a 2000, oh no, junior year 1980, February 1980, during Black History Month, she was talking about, you know what, I was thinking we should do, we should get involved with the Black History Program. Why? Because, because I know know a lot about, I want to know more about the black culture since, like, take a mile, walk a mile in your shoes. He was like, you don't want to do that, but, I, but we can, we'll come up with something. So, January 1981, Rachel, Mark, Moses, and Bethany met up, knowing that they only got Four more months to go. They still have to deal with. With Mona. And the New Jersey Rebelettes. Bethany loved her black leather jacket. That. When she spotted Montgomery. Wait, Moses. I'm about to say Montgomery over and over. Forgive me. It's Moses. Moses. She spotted Moses and one and hugged him. Thank you, Moses. I love me. I love my presence. Same here. Well, same here. So they, so they were the, the mightiest, thankful trio, as friends, to make it through another another year. But shockingly. Rachel did have, did ask, did ask about Paul, Mr. Paul. Well, his coughing is like powerful, but it's like he's going back and forth. It's, and, it, and it's happening like after, after the passing of Uncle Larry. Amen. All we can, hey now, all we can do is pray. Yeah, and to be on the on the mind, on to have a bright mindset for better things to come their way. They knew that time was flying by. Cause in 1981, they would have to have to say goodbye to Mackenzie. They had to deal with the so-called um, the so-called rebelettes, and the rebelettes, they with with the ranting that was stuck in Shirley and Michelle's head, they were gonna make sure not to let the school nurse clown them, punk them, scare them, because unfortunately they brought guns too. Michelle had a 9mm Beretta. And for Shirley, she had a had a 38 snub nose. And they were like 
while everybody was out, I mean, like, during lunchtime, even the nursing building, I mean, even the school nurse was having lunch. Come on, let's go. I think we're clear. Nobody noticed. But, gunshots went off. <gasps> Whoa! Get down. What's going on? The shots were firing. What happened? But someone had the nerve to call the call the police because of because they heard some gunshots and they told they told what happened. A student called the police. Gunshots were fired inside McKenzie High. And of course everybody knew who it was. Bethany didn't didn't say say who. Moses didn't say it. Rachel didn't say it. But the school nurse, oh boy, she was ticked off. Because the the school nurse, like the room that she works in, shot up in retaliation for for hurting. Mona took it way too far. And because of that, the Reb the New Jersey Rebelettes, a quart a quartet turned trio, they actually ended up um suspended. Matter of fact, expelled from McKenzie High. And everybody else was act everybody else acted like the munchkins. The little munchkins from Munchkinland. Ding dong the witch is dead. Da 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 Ding dong the wicked witch is dead. That's how they felt. So relieved. It was a it was a blessed moment for the New Jersey trio who were up to no good to be suspended or actually expelled because they they were not supposed to have guns. This is the second time when Mona brought a gun to school. About to kill Rachel, but the nurse wasn't playing it. But due to the fact that the nursing nursing office was ruined by gunshots and bullet holes, broken windows, Moses actually had an idea. Moses, along with Bethany and Rachel, decided to to pitch in and they they all ended up giving giving the school nurse six hundred dollars as a start to cover to pay up all the damages so she had to work somewhere else for safety reasons and they even thought of Putting her in the spotlight, referring to the February 1981 Black, Black History Month program. And guess what she wore? She wore a, a the beautiful, the most beautiful paisley dress, long sleeve. And the skirt, I mean, long sleeve dress, but the dress was kind of like a, a, a real long skirt. Long enough to cover the knee areas. Black leathered boots. 
leg high, I mean, leg high stilettos. She was singing, dancing, enjoying herself along with the, with the individuals who sung and performed reading history lessons and enact reenactments with Bethany still in the spotlight dressed up as a Black Panther. Remember, a black leather jacket with a beret hat. Bethany, Bethany did that. Montgomery dressed up in a flannel shirt and even Rachel got involved like so they in, so they walked around. They actually made made it so powerful to the fact that in memory of Uncle I mean, of Mister of Larry Uncle Larry, they ended the they ended. I mean Rachel Montgomery. No, Rachel, Moses, Bethany, and the school nurse ended. Hand in hand. Quoting Uncle Larry's, I am not ashamed to fight back. But after, but after they, un, they stopped holding hands, they all pulled their put their right fist up in the air for black black power black history power to the people too black too strong and speaking of which black history month is coming in a few days next week so be on the lookout for that afterwards after the program was over everybody was cleaning up going back to normal normal program, school programming, school schedule. Miss Miss Bethany got got welcomed with open arms by the school nurse. Oh, thank you so much. The school nurse started crying. She never felt so alive. Because of how, how serious they were, and how serious Moses, Rachel, and Bethany were. They hugged for f 15 seconds, like the school nurse was full of happiness and, and at the same time sadness because of what went down in her, in her nursing office. This was a, a chemistry, a, a real real love moment, a lifetime moment that Miss Bethany never forgot. And the school nurse was so pleased. Open arms. Feeling thankful to be in the program. Cause with her help, Bethany wanted her senior year to go out with a bang like that. But then, a couple weeks later, the school nurse actually wanted to talk to, wanted to talk to Moses' father. But then, but all of a sudden, she popped a question. You want to go on a date? For real? Moses' father, who was a hero cop from Cleveland, going on a date with the school nurse where Montgomery decided to pay, pay part of the damages. Because I actually, he was the one. Moses' father was the one that suspended. Well, Handcuffed and took 
the New Jersey Rebels out of school. That way they wouldn't do the same thing that they did to and that the thug did to his his wife. So they so they dated. But April two nineteen eighty one, Rachel, Bethany, and Moses dressed in white. Dressed in white. Man. Dressed in white. Heading to the senior prom. Everybody was so happy. To see them. See the three friends. Come together. Last year they were dressed in red, white, and blue like America. Now they're dressed in white. Knowing that this is their final year, they have to go out with a bang. Even even the cop, even the cop father, along with the school nurse, went to the prom together. <laughs> Wait, my. And as for Mr. Paul, well, uh, his coughing started calming down. He was back, like he was back to normal, but still facing. Still facing health issues that he started walking with a cane. Man. His his coughing was done. But he's walking with a cane now. He, he, he was there with his with his fam with his daughter to support his daughter. It's like everybody gave mad love. Mad love, mad respect to Bethany, Moses, and Rachel. That in the end of the prom, they were found out, <laughs> everybody found out that it was Moses, Moses Monroe, and Bethany Carver as the prom king and queen. And Rachel, she was the first maid. That's how how united the three individuals were. Confetti fell, balloons fell. It's like a happily ever after. Everybody was so pleased to be at the prom. But a couple days later, a couple weeks later, May 1981, the best moment in Bethany Carver's life. Graduation night. Dressed in red and white. Red for the, for the men, white for the women. Bethany received, received a diploma. And she actually was still bright. Now, if it wasn't for the Lord, if it wasn't for the help out of Moses, the confidential word of advice from, from Rachel, who was once her bully, to to the love and support from the school nurse they would have never made made it this far well she would have never made it this far and she actually was a valedictorian Bethany Carver a valedictorian for McKenzie High 1981 Rachel was in the top five. Moses, he didn't make the top ten, but he ain't ashamed about it. Because he was only point zero 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 one one away from being in the top ten. He was just glad that he was... He was awarded. Matter of fact, 
the, the school nurse actually rewarded them medals of honor. The medals that the Olympic Olympic competi competi competitors wore in honor, gold, silver, and bronze type medals, they were all gold for for bravery, for help, helping out one another, to rely on each other. And even after singing the alma mater, the McKenzie High alma mater, as the rebels, the rebels threw their hats in the air. Tears, hugs, pictures being taken from Polaroid Kodak, the old school cameras. Shake it like a Polaroid picture. <laughs> Marcus and Officer Monroe actually were there to see Montgomery. No, Mon <laughs> Moses. Moses. The nurse and the surprise prize the school nurse officer monroe asked ask the school nurse will you marry me after the graduation even rachel and bethany were like oh my gosh Yep, but a lot of things have changed. So, in, in June 1981, Mo Moses' father, the hero cop from Cleveland, married the school nurse. But then three months after that, The school nurse got pregnant. <laughs> but as for September, the three friends, Rachel, Bethany, and Moses, they had to split part ways. Bethany went to um, went to Union University. Mr. Mr. Moses, he went to the university, well, back at the time, Memphis State University. And as for Rachel, she went to Middle Tennessee State University. And they all graduated the same year. Full after serving four years in college, 1985, they all received bachelors. And in 1986, they decided to come back together. For one thing, despite the 10 year reunion, they didn't make, see the 10 year reunion yet, they came back to, to join join each other to reunite for a half decade reunion as in a five year reunion five years after Mackenzie High and at that time 1986 this song came came playing around the radio stations and verse 2 said something like this it said hey little boy you can't go where the others go Cause you don't look like they do Say hey old man how can you stand To think that way Did you really think about it Before you made the rules And he said son That's just the way it is Some things will never change That's just the way it is But oh don't you believe them Oh yeah 1986, the time when Bruce Hornsby and The Range released That's Just The Way It Is. And, of course, that song was so hot that 
Rachel had to pl play that repetitively. She brought it on tape. And that song kept her going. Kept her going. It made her think about her own life. And as for Bethany and Moses, they were planning to to get married together. But tragedy struck because in 1980 because in 1987 1987 Bethany lost her father because first he had dealt with a bad cough but then he started walking with a cane but then all of a sudden health issues started to decline like Uncle Larry that at the funeral she she quoted um, her deceased Uncle Larry's poem I'm not ashamed to fight back Montgomery was no Moses was there Rachel was there Mo Rachel was crying Moses he said that's that's my Bethany even Mr. Um, even Mr. Monroe, along with the uh, the school nurse and their firstborn daughter, by the name of Shanice, they actually came together it's Funny how Tom flies. Six years. And Miss Bethany, 25, no, no, 26 at the time, she was, she was introduced to Shanice by the school nurse and Shanice said, you know, you know my uh, my brother, my older brother, in saying that. What well, was it, step brother? Mm, quoted that uh, for a while. Yeah, my uncle Larry wrote and made that, and I stuck with it. You think you think that poem's gonna stick with me? Yes, because, because my, because when you say that poem, you got to remember that the Lord is watching every movement and everything will be all right if you let him in. That poem helped me get through hard times in my life and that poem really, really is a good way to start living again. So, the fact is, after Shanice and Bethany had a talk about that poem, it started to dawn on her. But yeah. But, it's crazy that it was tough for her. Tough for Bethany to move on. First Jolene in 1968. And now in 1987. Paul. Man. But. She was still taking care of her. Care of herself. She got a house. House. She got a life on her own. A diploma. To a degree. A bachelor's degree. To. Working a job, nine to five. But 
all hell broke loose because while they while Rachel and Moses were planning to help help prepare the wedding for both Moses and Moses and Bethany three rival foes from high from middle and high school came back with a vengeance and they were driving in a beat up Dodge Charger from 1976. No, no, 1972. And they all had ski masks on. They spotted spotted the three friends. And it's kind of like the 80s version of Men's Society, the drive-by scene. Yo, what's up now, partner? Oh, Bethany. Remember us? <gasps> Moses. Rachel. Doug. <gasps> and then, so, gunshots were fired. From... From one had a Tech 9, the other had a Newsy, and the driver had two pistols shooting. But what's funny about that? After they they did the shots, they left. But while while they were getting chased, while they were getting chased, I mean, getting shot at, well, nobody was hurt except Miss You Know Who, Rachel, the sellout. But to sell out towards Mona, it turns out she she took the worst blow. While ducking, well, let's just say that all walls are not safe because some of the some walls were were covered in bullet holes. She had to take the the big the biggest blow. Then a couple bullets, two to the gut, two to the gut, one in the back, trying to, trying to survive. But she lost that round. And as for Moses, yeah, Moses ran. Well, while while that happened, while. They were getting shot at. Moses ran, ran to to get to to take uh, Rachel to a safe spot. But it turns out he got shot tr tragically as well. And Miss Bethany, she was the only one that survived the the drive by. Spotted her. Spotted her, what could have been husband, and her best friend, both dead on dead in front of her eyes. A double homicide. Luckily, it wasn't triple, but a double homicide was far enough. And as KRS One said back in 1990 from the song "Material Love's Gonna Get You," love's gonna get you. Then I found out it was robbing his crew. Now tell me what the heck are, am I supposed to do? As in, Miss Bethany found out about this. <gasps> Who would do want to kill me? How did I? Oh no. 
Dun, dun, dun. It was Mona. Big Bad Mona, Shirley, and Michelle getting revenge for being expelled from school because somebody called the police on them for shooting at the school nurse's office. But Bethany did not call the police. No. But What's shocking is that she walked outside, kn kn kneeling down, screaming to the heavens at the top of her lungs, saying, Mona! Mona. Fade to black. Fade to black as in. Two funerals. And one day. Can. Can Mo. Can Bethany. Accept all this. Can she handle this. Honestly. No. Because the fact is, it was it was pain for Monroe, the, the Monroe family, the school nurse, Marcus, the older brother, and the police officer that married the school nurse to bury their son. But on the other side. Miss Bethany had to bury, bury, um, both Rachel as well as Marcus. So they, like, they had two funeral services. And everybody from Mackenzie High that went to school with Miss Bethany and graduated with them. With her, with her. They actually had no other choice. But to commemorate their blessings, their memories, Just pay, pay their final respects. Marcus, the older brother, did the speak and speaking, as well as Bethany. And the father, along the um, the school nurse, and Shanice, filled with tears. They were hurt. They were so hurt to see how Bethany had to live with two friends deceased, buried on the same day. Man, it's crazy. But after dealing with depression and being single, she couldn't even. And live it down. Driving down, down the streets, in a in a brown caddy, that she had since 1979. When it was the 1980 edition. The the brown box caddy, the Cadillac Deville. <sighs> Miss Bethany was hurt. I mean, she's been to a lot of hell and heaven. But mostly hell because of the bullies and how hardships caused her to slow down. To losing a lot of people. She lost her family. Now she lost her friends. And one of them to be considered the wife, the husband to her. Now that is too much. It's hurt. It hurts for her. But dig this. It took a long time for her to heal but because of the song Bruce Horns Be and the Range is the way it is she played that song repetitive with tears falling down as she looks back in the memories that she had with Rachel Rachel who was considered the sellout of the New Jersey Rebelettes 
to be a friend to Mo to Moses to the fact that one day after a let's say it was like a like around six to nine month depression where she had to had to sleep sleep early at night early at night she went to bed she didn't even have time to watch the news she just wanted to go to bed get up early in the morning and she even had the nerve to come up with a gun permit she was el eligible to have a gun because if anyone was trying to kill her she's going to have to get ready for war but God would forbid that to happen because he started to head back to God between focusing on God to listening to Bruce Hornsby buying his album with the song the hit single the way it is as being one of her favorite songs because of Rachel she decided you know what I got to keep this moving but after a six to nine month depression on a cold on a cold day let's say that 1988 one day in 88 Marcus the older brother of Mon Moses he came came to Bethany How's, how's life going? Not good. I understand the pain, but six to nine months of depression is about time to start stepping out. Matter of fact, remember, remember senior year when you stood out for the Black History Program with my brother Mo Moses? This is the time of the year again. Time for you to bring back the powerful, God-fearing woman and the bravest woman that you can be. And because, because Marcus had a good talk with him, he even told her that Shanice has been worried sick about her. Hoping that things will go okay, but it's not. And she just don't want... Shanice don't want Miss Bethany to fall in a negative mindset for the rest of her life. But, but thanks to uh, a wake-up call from, from Moses, well, Marcus, Marcus, and, and the fear of her her life from Shanice. <sighs> Miss Bethany Carver decides to put her her fear and not being accepted in society shtick to an end. Because in February of two of 1988, she was spotted coming to a town meeting where a lot of folks will come together talking about the damages that's been done by the New Jersey rebelettes. Big Bad, Mona, Shirley, and Michelle. But dig this. It's been like this for a couple years after being, being expelled from school. And... Not one F, not one D, not one care was given. But dig this. Miss Bethany came to the town meeting, said, she spoke her piece. She walked to the microphone. Black turtleneck. Black jeans or dark, the darkest blue jeans she ever found. 
black beret hat on her head, black leather jacket, bringing back her Black Panther, Panther related, mm, Black History mm, attitude that she had for her senior year Black History program from high school to standing out. She did a speech. The, the microphone was a Sure 55SH Deluxe microphone on a stand. She got all the individuals, black, white, whatever race, to get together. She had enough. She was fighting for her life. She was willing to take a chance to stay alive. She even brought up her, her run-ins with Big Bad Mona and the others. But dig this. Enough was enough. She was ready for war. They wanted war. They asked for it. But the only way to end the war is if they end up locked up. But instead, they want to go out blazing glory. Die. That's on them. But our, for us, our goal is to survive. Not to die. Or take the blame. We will have our justice. We will have a day. And that day will come. But dig this. After she she made it made it known, some of the news news reporters, the cameramen, the photographers, they put her on the head of the newspapers. They made her made her Stand out like she was the biggest news story yet. They put her on the news. But the very next day after that. Rocking her black leather jacket and black beret hat. Found finna get ready to head to the grave site. Because she knew the time was come. Now remember. She had her first gun. Bethany had her first gun. But she decided not to use it. Until, unless it was for protection. Because the only protection that she had that was more important than a 9mm gun was God. And there goes that iconic beat up Dodge Charger from the 70s. Well, well, well. If it isn't Miss Black Panther... What do you want from me? Well, for starters, I want you to you to, to back up off that car of yours. Now walk backwards. Now. Okay. Hand, hands up. Walk backwards slowly like she was about to walk the line. As if she was caught up, as Bethany was caught up in the DUI. You give us one good reason why we have to come here. Because you're the talk of the town. And also you want to get revenge on me. As if I called the cops over what you did at, for the nurse, the, the school nurse. And... Thank, thankfully for you, you got rid of my black fiancé and my friend, the sellout, as you would put it. But mark my words, you're not going to get away with this. Well, that's when you're wrong. Michelle, Shirley, get her. So, so they came to her. Guns cocked. Shirley, Shirley pushed her to the ground. Michelle got her gun cocked. Aiming at her. But this time they were, they were um doing the 9mm, the pistol type. Pistol packing. New Jersey Rebelettes. 
Big Bad Mona, Shirley, and Michelle. You know, it's funny. After what went down for over a decade, you really haven't figured out our, our routine. And all of a sudden, you decided to ridicule us, get us peed off. You had a lot of people to stand, stand back with you so you can have your clout, your fame, and your glory. <laughs> well, what do you say to that? God fearing Bethany Carver. What else can I say? That's just the way it is. Well, it's not. Because I got a gun and I am ready to take you out. Just like, like I did with Rachel and Moses. Welcome to the real world. And of course, to make matters worse, Mona had the nerve to call Bethany the infamous, nastiest word. It rhymes with rich, but everybody knows this. Another word that stands for female dog. Disrespectful to women. The B word. Mm. Any last words? Any last words, Miss Bethany Carver? As Michelle, Shirley, and Mona will, had their guns aimed at her. Like the, like the three, three gangsters that were about to, that were up on top of Crazy K from Tales from the Hood and that and they really did kill him at that movie. But in the beginning when they when they stand up in front of him, it turns out a group of police came out of nowhere and they killed them. And even Crazy K was like, Saved by the double crossing cop. Dang. <laughs> oh nuts. Cause he was still shot up and he he, he was not pleased. I mean, he was not faced with all this, but he was shocked. I would be shocked if I was saved by the cops while I was about to get killed to death. But for Bethany, for Bethany, she said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they have done. And Mona's like, screw this. Screw this. This is business. Oh, yeah? Well, this, oh, yeah? Before you pull that trigger, you gotta remember. I mean, you gotta know one thing. What is that? And we like, Oh, for crying out loud, let's just wrap it up already. Ready. That's what Shirley said. Yeah. Yeah, let's just do it. Michelle like, yeah, let's just do this. Bethany said, this is personal. And because she said that, a surprise, a surprise attack. <laughs> A slingshot with pebbles. Mm -hmm. Shirley got hit in the in the arm where her hand was on the gun. Ow! 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 What the heck? Michelle like, what's, what's up with you? I got hit, hit by a pebble. What? Oh dang, yo, yo. Oh dang, you're bleeding. What? Oh, dang, you're bleeding. But, matter of fact,
that? Who's who's stood in a slingshot with the pebbles? That's what they want to know. Michelle. Michelle got hit with the pebble. I mean, as well. But instead of the foot, I mean the arm, she got hit in the knee. Cursing, cause the pain was so deep. What the heck is? Oh no, you didn't. Oh no, you didn't. Well, it was shocking. It was shot niece that's doing the slingshot, shot attack. But unfortunately, let's just you know the old saying, wrong place, wrong time. She was she was getting shot at. Big Bad Mona discovered Shanice shoot me doing the slingshot sling attack. Shot attack that she ended up getting shot at. <coughs> but Shanice didn't die. Shanice over here. Mm -hmm. Back up, Shanice. Marcus. Marcus was the one that, um, Marcus was the one that told her to back up. Back up! <laughs> but while, while Mona was getting, while Sh Mona was shooting at Shanice, Miss Bethany got up. <laughs> stepped on her stepped on Mona's foot foot punched her he punched her in the gut like upper gut like upper gut a couple times to the gut oh and Miss Bethany was swinging like like Muhammad Ali boom 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 this is Swatted the nine millimeter gun out of her hand. This is for Rachel. <laughs> Boom. This is for Mon. I mean, this is for Moses. <laughs> and this is for me. <laughs> Doing the uppercut like Debo did the uppercut from Friday on Red. Red, but this time, time, it was red punching Debo, like in retaliation. You know, the iconic Debo upper gut red causing him to fly back. But in the end of the movie, after getting jumped, after getting beat up by, by Debo, by Craig Debo, although of course people gonna claim that Craig cheated. Look, do you know how big Debo was? Shut up. This is how serious it was. And Red, he punched Debo back to being knocked out and grabbed his grandmama's chain and his bike. But enough movie references. Shout out to Friday, the Friday crew, DJ Pooh, Ice Cube. Rest in peace, Tommy, Tiny Zeus, Lester Jr. Bethany Punch, Upper Gut, Mona. Got her, caused her to start flying, flying back. And then, boom, landed to the floor. <sighs> but as Shirley, but as Shirley... Spotted the whole thing. She knew. She knew that Bethany was leaving. So she. She tried to keep it quiet. Crawled to get her gun. As well as, well as Michelle. Getting her gun. Oh, 
But unfortunately, instead of a pebble this time, Shanice, with the help of Marcus, launched an apple, like from an apple tree, on a slingshot. <laughs> Michelle got knocked the heck out by an apple. <laughs> And as for Shirley, she got knocked the heck out by an apple as well. <laughs> but as for Mona, oh, Bethany, 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 I'm not done with you yet. <laughs> Slow motion. The heart, the, the pounding of a heartbeat, echoing, slow motion. Mona pulls out her gun. Bethany turns around, door open as he's about to come in. But then, boom, boom, two gunshots. Gunshots. Bethany fell. Bethany fell as if she just got hit. But no. Me. Get up, Bethany. Get up, Bethany. Huh? Who would... Wait a minute. Bethany if fell, but after we told get up, was like, wait. Who? I mean, who? Who called my name? And she found out it was Mr. I mean, Mr. Monroe and the school nurse. They ended off, as husband and wife, they ended, ended the shtick. The New Jersey Rebelette shtick. Because Mona got shot twice. And she's dead. Even the so-called nurse, school nurse, turned wife, did the pulse routine. All right. Send all units. We need, we need an ambulance and... And a couple of police cars. So with the help of the Monroe family, Shanice, Marcus, Officer Monroe, and the school nurse, Bethany was safe and sound. They came, I mean, Shanice and, and the school nurse came to her with open arms. Oh, no, thank gosh, you're so you're still alive. Man, it's crazy. But all of a sudden, things changed. After the so-called being bullied and being bullied thing by the New Jersey Rebelettes came to an end, Bethany Carver started to live on. Matter of fact, everybody did. Now, in the epilogue, how do I say this? In 2000, after working 31, in 2000, after working 30, 30 to 31 years in the force, Moses, Marcus, Moses and Marcus's father retired from the force. He settles, he settles down in McKenzie with his, his wife, the school nurse. And, and 
sadly, he passed away from colon cancer in 2006. His, I mean, but his daughter, Shanice, in 1999, well, it turns out she, uh, she became serious about her lifetime decisions. As in, she went back to, I mean, she went to phase one, the same phase one that Bethany Carver did. I mean, she dealt with bullies, but the words from Uncle Larry lived on from one generation to another. I'm not ashamed to fight back. And Shanice actually, on graduation night in 1999, she ended up Graduating as a valedictorian, just like Bethany Carver, but at her graduation, she would like to ask everyone to give a standing ovation to the guest speaker, Miss Mrs. Bethany Carver. Standing ovation for Bethany Carver, a former McKenzie rebel. To speak at Shawnee's graduation in 1999, <laughs> boy, the school nurse who retired in 1995, she actually was was full of tears. It was it was a reunion for the school nurse to see Bethany guest speak for her for her her alum for her alum school to a graduating class of 1999 consisting of the late Moses's sister in the top of the class she made it happen and she even quoted her her late uncle Larry's iconic poem which stood out that everyone decided to join along when they said I we're not ashamed to fight back everybody joined in and it was all but love mad love for Miss Bethany and you and after the graduation was over the caps being thrown Shanice and Bethany, they had a hug of a life. Open arms. 15 hour, 15 minutes. Where they're saying, thank you, thank you so much. I'm so proud of you. Or the iconic, I love you. That was all but love. But... After, after all, being accepted for who you are and what you believe, mostly for God, Bethany Carver made a difference. But, a few years later, leading to somewhat, I fictionally this year, well, but the way I see see the ending of this, it's like this. 
Mr. Mr. Marcus Monroe, the older brother of the late Moses Monroe, he actually became a minister. He became a minister. And he and he has he became a minister, a church, a, a church preacher. He resides in Humboldt, Tennessee. Shanice, after graduating, she ended up becoming an MBA, an MBA student. From a from a bachelor's from an associate's to bachelor's to master's and she actually planned to be planned to receive her doctorates man after spending three years at a community college getting all of her her classes in order. She graduated in 2004. I mean, 2002. But let's say she graduated from Dyersburg State. Then she went on to her hometown, back to her hometown, where she received a bachelor's from Bethel University. She spent two, around two, two to three years again. But after, after her father died, she decided to to keep his memory alive, wearing a T-shirt with a picture, with the words. You were always a Cleveland cop. I mean, you were always a, a hero. From Cleveland to McKenzie. And she drove a Dodge Monaco. It was blue. To honor her, the memory of her older brother, Moses. Rock and Loke sunglasses. But when she had her masters, she went to the University of Tennessee and Martin. And she got her doctorates from Union. So Shanice went everywhere. Shanice Monroe from MBA to the doctorates. Bethany, she still works a nine to five job. But for right now, I'm not going to um, bring up the detail about it. But I do know one thing. I do know one thing about Bethany. Since I make, since this is a fictional story and I'm telling it, she overcame her, her downfalls. Her depression and she also felt thankful to keep living but because of the black leather jacket and the black beret routine she still she still felt like she was part of of the Black Panther movement. Like she finally had to use her words. But as her uncle Larry would say, continue to use your words until you say enough is enough. So 
throughout her life, she thanked the Lord for allowing her to see all the things that she's been through. From her mama Jolene, to her father Paul, to her uncle Larry, to her African American boyfriend, friend to boyfriend, to what could have been husband, Mo Moses, her friend, a bully, a former New Jersey rebelette, to a friend. passed away by her own own crew that she turned her back on and left but as for Michelle and Michelle and Shirley turns out they still serve in life in prison for the double homicide and the and the damages that they've caused the murders that they caused Ever since they were caught lacking by Shanice, Marcus, and the leader, we all you already know what happened to Big Bad Mona. Big Bad Mona went to the Big Bad Grave. Shot down to death for trying to shoot. Bethany down after, after getting punched. Yeah. Bethany, though. Bethany started to take life to her own hands. To the fact that she started to believe that with God, all things are possible. If it wasn't for the Lord guiding her, if it wasn't for having a good set of friends, a good mindset to overcome fear and to be accepted for who she was. And this is what acceptance does. If you accept yourself for who you are and others want to take your shine away from you, who are you really accepting? Are you accepting God or are you accepting the devil or are you accepting the man in the middle? The man is is a key word to lead is a key part of leading to the devil because men can be misleading you can't trust every man because they're not 100% correct nobody's perfect nobody is so last so what about Bethany well how do I end it well after going through a couple couple health issues and still keeping up with the Lord and her job she still gets recognition driving and last time I checked she was driving around in her in her box Cadillac her 1980 DeVille still in good condition Like one of her treasures of her lifetime. I mean, she wore a last time she was spotted wearing a t-shirt with with rest in peace, an airbrush t-shirt made for her with the words rest in peace to Jolene. Paul, Larry, rest in peace, Jolene, Paul, Larry, Rachel, Moses, and Moses' father. She was rocking her aviator sunglasses. Walk, she walked inside her brown Cadillac DeVille from 1980. Put on 
all gassed up, all oiled up. Tires are all looking good. Not one flat. Car washed. And she played the song that everybody, that made her think about everybody that she loved and missed dearly from her McKenzie school days. Which leads me to end, end it with a song. Now, I already sung the first and second verse with the chorus, but there is a verse three. Well, they passed the law in 64 to give those who ain't got a little more. But it only goes so far because the law don't change another's mind when all the things that are in time. Is this line on the color bar? No, no. But that's just the way it is. Some things will never change. That's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. So, after me. Because of the song, The Way It Is by, by Bruce Hornsby and the Range, that was the song that kept her peaceful. Driving, driving, in, a, driving in a Cadillac. And I guess the goal is, as people say, riding until the wheels fall off. And that's what Bethany Carver is going to do. Until it's over with. We only live once. But Bethany Carver is never ashamed to fight back. Are you? I hope not. And that's it. My long awaited episode four. Despite almost three hours long. Because it took me a long time to come up with something. And the story is fictional. The characters are fictional. But the main character, Bethany Carver, is an inspiration. With all that being said, if you like what you see and heard... Especially when it comes to being accepted. Because people don't want to accept you. Others, they they do. Because accepting others means a lot. If God can accept you for doing the right things, would you accept yourself and others around you? I hope so. If you like what you saw, feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Click the notification bell and there will be more in stores. And also... The link to the last episode will be in the description bar down below. And this episode, long-awaited episode 4 of Cold Man's Winter Season 5, has been brought to you by this week's Sweet Lady of the Week, where a, a real-life woman gets recognized for all the hardships that she faced and the accomplishments that has been given. So, who is the Sweet Lady of the Week? Well, based on the story I told about Bethany Carver, who's the Bethany Carver that I see in my real life? Well, there is one Bethany Carver in real life I can think of. And that right there is none other than a fellow co-worker of mine. Someone that I can, I can call like... Oh... A teammate. It's like an aunt. A teacher. Someone that needs recognition. And that person, that special person that inspired me to make a fictional story about Bethany Carver. Well, in real life, she is a Beth. 
And that Beth, in real life, that I'm referring to as a sweet lady of the week, is none other than Mrs. Beth Cordere. C-O-R-D-E-R. And to Miss Beth, I definitely did not forget about you. That's why I want to thank you for all the hard work that you you have you brought. And there's, as Tupac Shakur would say, there is no way I can pay you back. But the plan is to show you that I understand. That you are appreciated. Well, with all that being said, this is yours truly, Taylor Jones, signing out. Stay tuned for more Cold Man's Winter Season 5. <laughs>